Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to wait a, um, just a, a little bit longer to let more people join. Um, so thank you. All right, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so excited to welcome Tim and start our campus history series this semester. My name is Allison Hughes and I'm part of the program planning and outreach team at NC State University Libraries. And I'm so happy you joined us for our first program this semester. The libraries and its partners are working to ensure that our programs are welcoming and affirming for everyone involved. That means that everyone from organizers to attendees has an important role to play in contributing to a respectful and positive environment. That's why we ask you to reflect on the way you pose comments and questions in the chat to ensure that they do, they do not harm other participants. When we speak, the impact of our words is just as important as our intent. Today, we ask that you engage in this program with exploration and curiosity while being kind and intentional with your words for the sake of our community. During the presentation, we ask that you remain muted. If you have any questions or memories you would like to share, please place them in the chat and we'll collect them for a question and answer session after the presentation. From here, I'll, I'll hand things over to our partners at the Alumni Association. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrea Sellers and I'm the Assistant Director for Regional Engagement with NC State's Alumni Association. I just want to take a minute to say thank you to everyone for joining us. A special thank you to members of the NC State Alumni Association. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to thank our partners over at NC State Libraries for their support in these events. If you're interested in any future campus history events, I would like to encourage you to join us for our um, Campus History Series Campus Architecture Tour on October 6th. That will be another virtual event that will be coming up. And I'll go ahead and drop the link to that in the chat. But with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Allison. Thank you. Now to introduce our speaker, Tim Peeler. Tim is a Vail, North Carolina native who traces his roots in the state to somewhere around 1740. His family has been here ever since though he personally was outsourced to South Carolina for about five years in the 1990s. He's been back in Raleigh since 1994 and at NC State since 2004. After receiving an English degree from NC State in 1987, Tim has written for newspapers, magazines, websites, and all kinds of media outlets. He's written three and a half books on NC State basketball and is in the beginning stages of his next one. Currently, Tim works for NC State's University Marketing and Communications, where he writes about what is going on at NC State with its students, its alumni, and its history. He's been a fan of NC State football his entire life and began reporting on Wolfpack, Wolfpack football in 1994. You can find more information about Tim and his work in the chat. We would also love to hear your feedback on this event and we'll place the survey in the chat. Participants who complete their survey will be entered into a raffle for a chance to win Tim's books and NC State football mem memorabilia. From here, I'm gonna hand things off to Tim. 
Thank you so much, Allison, and everyone else here for being here today. <clears throat> you know, it's always an exciting time when uh, the first game of the season is just a couple of hours away and we got just a little bit longer to wait. But I want to start out by just talking about the beauty of college football for me is that it's one of the few times that all of us can get together, whether we're alumni, students, parents, whatever, multiple generations of families get together for football. And that's what makes it special to me. Uh, it's a time for family, for reunion, celebration of a common cause. Um, it's always an opportunity to create some rivalries. Uh, and we have so many of our rivals and our neighbors who we may not have a yard that looks as good as theirs, but if we win against them, we have a whole year to talk about that. Um, for me, football, NC State football is where I first found my profession. I first started writing in 1984 about NC State football when I was a student and a reporter for technician. Um, but it's also a place where my kids spent, got to spend time while I was working still in the press box with their granddads and being able to go with them to the game. I'm sure everybody here has a similar experience of that. Um, it's a it's a tough time for me this year because it's the first time my dad, who passed away in June, will not be able to go with uh, my kids to the games. And um, so it's a little bit um, of, a, of a sad time for me thinking about that. But over the next 40 minutes or so, I want to talk about some of the um, highlights of the 13 decades of NC State football. Football is a binding agent for us all. And I'm sure we all have great memories of our time going to games, things that we remember from games, even if we were watching those games all of last year on television and not being able to be together at Carter Finley Stadium. Um, for my part, I can't tell you how much I have enjoyed the last 30 or so years of just collecting the stories, some of which I'm going to share today, about NC State football. There will certainly be time for questions at the end, but um, the very first order of business for me in this discussion is wishing a happy birthday to the Wolfpack. That may seem odd, you may not know about this, but this year, this month, is the 100th anniversary of NC State using the Wolfpack as its nickname. Um, Allison, I want you to advance to the next slide to show folks what um, uh, the first real version of um, Wolfpack um, logos that we had. Well, let's go back to the pink and blue. NC State's first colors were pink and blue, um, which this is the only rendering of anything I've ever seen with the pink and blue colors representing NC State. And this was done long after the colors were changed to red and white in 1895. Um, but we chose the Wolfpack at the um, suggestion of alumni from uh, New York who said we needed something distinctive, something that nobody else had something that um, would resonate uh, for its fierceness, for its uniqueness, and for its simple ability to bring people together. And if we look at the next slide of what that looks like, we have so many versions of Wolfpack um, live mascots, um, happy mascots. The, um, I love the two pictures down here in the corner where both mascots um, are leading the live wolves and the live dogs that we've used over the years to uh, represent what it means to be part of the pack and um, the, the way that we engage so many different people with those mascots. And in the center, you'll see the newest uh, version of the mascot, Tuffy Three, who uh, was brought on board this year after the loss of uh, our second um, Tamascan uh, dog that uh, we've used to represent a live wolf. Uh, and I know everybody's everybody gets excited about the new puppy, and um, he has certainly uh, already been welcomed with op open arms. Uh, I want to go back to the very beginnings of uh, where NC State football started, and that was on campus at um, an open part of campus near Pullen Park, where they lined off the field with a plow. Uh, and eventually, what we built was Riddick Stadium. And um, what you will see in Riddick Stadium is that it was an old, um, Allison, let's go forward, um, an old grandstand style uh, baseball, football, and track that the university first used as its own campus home. 
um, over the years, it was built onto in very small segments. They would build a set of bleachers at a time to uh, finally um, build the entire east side of the, of the uh, stadium. And eventually, piece by piece, they built the west side of the stadium. And um, it, um, it was not a great home. It only held about 20,000 spectators, I think. Uh, and it was not, while it was on campus in Central, right behind Holiday Hall, um, it was not, there was not room for expansion. In the early days of uh, NC State football, um, there were some players of note and distinction, one of which turned out to, ended up being a governor, if you will advance to the next picture. Um, Omax Gardner is on the left-hand picture, uh, the, uh, the player on the right. Those are great old uniforms to see what uh, football was like in the day. Uh, a leather helmet, no face guard, no numbers. Um, the things around their necks, um, while they did have leather helmets, they didn't have face guards. Those things around their necks are nose guards that they often wore um, to protect their noses in games. Um, and those two guys, uh, Jay Platt Turner, Omax Gardner, um, played at the turn of the century. To the, to the right is uh, Gus Ripple, who was the first player in the state of North Carolina to earn All-American honors. It came with a little bit of an asterisk, however, because he gained All-American honors in a game which NC State went down to Atlanta to play Georgia Tech in the, at the height of the Spanish flu pandemic. Mm -hmm. I think we all know what that's kind of like now. We can understand this a little bit better. They went down there uh, with about half their team, um, 30 of the players on the team or 30 of the members of the school and about 10 football players had been called up into service during World War II, uh, World War I, I'm sorry. And um, they had a very limited team. That team ended up losing to John Heisman's Golden Hurricane by a score of 128 to nothing. It's the worst defeat in NC State football history. But in that game, John Ripple picked up a fumble, ran it all the way back for a touchdown, and there was a penalty for holding that called it back. But he so impressed one person on that play that um, in the All-American team that came out uh, at the end of the year, John Ripple was listed as an um, All-American defensive lineman, and he's the first player in the, in the history of the state to earn All-American honors. Football in the 20s was a little difficult and different. Um, NC State had a hard time uh, coming back from the Spanish flu pandemic, uh, had a hard time coming back from um, World War I, uh, fielded some good teams. But in 1929, it did something that it had never done before. It won the uh, Southern Conference Championship. Uh, on that next slide is... Um, all-American and, and College Football Hall of Fame um, inductee, Jack McDowell, who was the leader of that team in 19, I'm sorry, it says 1929. It's a 1927 Southern Conference Championship. It's the only time NC State had ever won that championship. Um, led by a coach named Gus Tabell, who coached football and basketball at NC State. Um, it was actually kind of a claimed title as much as it was a one title because there were so many teams in the Southern Conference that both Florida and Georgia laid claim to that title too. But NC State had the best winning percentage um, out of all the uh, teams in the conference at that time. Um, the 1930s were a difficult time for NC State because of the depression, because of the low attendance at the school. There were multiple sports that had to be canceled uh, because of it, uh, because of the depression and the low attendance. But football remained the same. Um, this, um, this slide coming up shows what football was like a little bit in the uh, 30s because, um, um, well, actually, I want I wanted to point this slide out because uh, this is what Riddick football or Riddick Stadium looked like during a football game. Just wondering if you notice what the crowd looks like there. Besides the fact that it's an all white crowd. Um, football was an event, even in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, where people came and they came dressed uh, in their finest. Everyone here has on a white shirt and a black tie for the men, and there are all dresses for the women. Um, 
it, it shows how things have maybe changed through the years, uh, going to um, you know a more formal celebration of football to what we have now, which are you know mm -hmm. all kinds of uh, things that are different from um, people who are painted up, uh, face bodies, everything to a much more informal looking crowd than uh, you would see here. Um, the next slide is the 30s of what um, uh, small team, they were very small teams at the time, but there was, um, you know, excitement around um, football, uh, as you can see um, in the 20s. That's what football looked like. Uh, they did have football programs. The first football program was printed in 1919, I believe. Um, then following up after that, um, we go to the 30s where things are a little a little less um, successful at the time. Uh, going into the to the war years of the 40s, um, football was was still a huge part of campus life, but um, because of the war, very few um, players could compete because NC State did as a army uh, training unit did not allow its players to compete in football. Uh, all those uh, thousands of people who came here to participate in uh, training for World War II did not play football. <clears throat> um, up until the World War II, football was kind of um, the dominant sport on campus. It was uh, baseball. It was obviously the first sport that was um, introduced in the 1890s, uh, but it was the primary and dominant sport. But it was also a huge money loser um, in the 30s and 40s um, and going into the 50s. NC State had all of these debts that it was uh, racking up for football. Uh, they owed about $50,000 to the um, um, school cafeteria for feeding all the players. They owed about $40,000 to Johnson Lamb. Uh, sporting a good equipment, and they just kept piling up the bills and piling up the bills. And in 1954, or in the early 1950s, uh, Chancellor Kerry Boston went to the football coaches, went to the Wolfpack Club um, leaders and said, you know what, this just isn't working out. We're, we're losing money hand over fist. We'll never get out of our debt. Uh, we don't know how we're going to do this, we're just going to eliminate football. And right about the time in 1953 that the ACC was formed, NC State was discussing leaving football behind completely. Um, and uh, the ACC said, if you don't have football, you can't come and be a part of the conference. Um, NC State was, being, was very successful in basketball because of the uh, exploits and success of um, basketball coach Everett Case who came here in 1946 uh, and built a overnight sensation and success and very um, lucrative basketball program. And um, Terry Boston's point at the time was, we have a good basketball program. We're making money from that. We have a great new arena uh, called Reynolds Coliseum. We're making money from that. We have a terrible football stadium um, called Riddick Stadium that can only uh, host about 20,000 fans. So why not just get rid of football? Well, he was convinced uh, by Harry Stewart, who was the leader of the Wolfpack Club at the time, and some others, um, including the coaches, students, to keep football as a sport. Now, the debt was still there. The, um, the lack of success was still there. Uh, NC State had not had uh, many winning seasons since that 1927 Southern Conference Championship. Um, and so there was a, a renewed emphasis put on being successful in uh, football. And um, that began when NC State hired from um, Michigan State, an assistant coach who had just helped that team, Michigan State, win a national championship. His name was Earl Edwards. He was an engineer, which is kind of perfect for uh, um, an NC State head coach. He, he was trained at Penn State. He left Penn State uh, early in, 19, in the 1950s because Penn State decided to hire somebody 
uh, instead of him as their head coach. He was always the coach in waiting. And then Joe Paterno became the head coach at Penn State, and he never got an opportunity to become the, the head coach at his alma mater. But he did come to NC State. He established a huge recruiting uh, presence in the state of Pennsylvania, where he came from, to bring in um, huge numbers of players, especially at some of the um, offensive and defensive line positions. Uh, he brought in a young uh, running back named Dick Christie to uh, lead um, his team in those first few years. He was one of his first recruits. All of those guys came down from Pennsylvania. And in 1957, one of the biggest miracles in NC State football history happened when Coach Edwards' team came in won, um, and won the uh, ACC championship, its first one. They won it, um, and this is one of my favorite pictures uh, of all time, um, of Dick Christie on top of his teammates at South Carolina down in Columbia. Um, if you could go to the next picture uh, right there. Uh, he's being carried on the, on the shoulder of his, of his teammates. In that game, which NC State had to win to have a, a chance to win the ACC championship, Dick Christie scored all 29 of NC State's points. He scored, scored them on touchdowns, and after the game clock had ended because South Carolina committed a penalty, he convinced Coach Edwards to let him attempt the only field goal he kicked all year long. It was 39 yards. And um, if he made it, NC State won the um, ACC championship. If he missed it, they didn't. Um, he went out, he kicked it. It was kind of a wobbly, low kick, and it barely cleared the goalpost. But NC State won that game 29 to 26, thanks to Dick Christie, who scored every point in the game. On the bus ride back from that game, um, Earl Edwards. Um, when, when the bus stopped on the way back, he called a young guy um, down in Wilmington, North Carolina, who had heard the results of the uh, contest uh, and told Coach Edwards that he wanted to come and play at NC State. And that next slide shows who that player was. His name was Roman Gabriel. He was the first great um, All-American player. He's a two-time All-American, two-time ACC Player of the Year, academic All-American. Uh, who went on to the NFL to become um, one of the top stars in the NFL. He was uh, NFL Player of the Year once, played for the Los Angeles Rams and the uh, Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, but that 57 championship that um, NC State won helped uh, Coach Edwards bring Roman Gabriel to NC State. The 1960s were the, the heyday of NC State football. Earl Edwards led his team to five ACC titles. Schools only won seven ACC, I'm sorry, eight ACC titles total. Earl Edwards won five of them um, in 1957 and the 60s. Uh, he was a class guy. He made all of his players take etiquette lessons on how to eat in a restaurant because they were always uh, going to places when they were on the road. Uh, he was also um, someone willing to sacrifice success as a coach he is a, NC State's uh, winningest coach with 77, 77 victories uh, in his career, but he's also the losingest coach in NC State history because he went on the road um, to play a whole lot of uh, his games. He would only play two or three home games a year to collect money so that he could help put uh, money aside to build a new uh, football stadium. Um, he knew Riddick was bad. He knew he could never get uh, – top teams to come to uh, Raleigh to play. So he went to places like Los Angeles, to, Mo to Wyoming, to Louisiana. Uh, he would travel all over the place, even going back to Michigan State, to help get money to put aside to, to build a new football stadium. Um, if, if we, on the next slide, you can see what Riddick Stadium looked like when it was um, at near the end of its life. Um, it is right in the middle of campus, but it was kind of crumbling at that time. You can see it is not a great facility, even though it's sort of right there in the shadow of uh, uh, main administration buildings and um, a bell tower. But it was just not a place that could be expanded to host a major college football team. So Earl Edwards would 
play so many games on the road, even for an extended period of time, NC State, North Carolina rivalry games were always played in Chapel Hill. And we would um, go back and forth to see who, you know, we would alternate who the home team was. So NC State played home games in Chapel Hill at Keenan Stadium because Riddick Stadium was not sufficient to uh, hold the crowds and certainly not sufficient to generate the funds the school needed to um, um, to build a new stadium. So in 1966, well, actually in 1964, um, ground was broken on a new stadium. It was designed by Charles Kahn, who was a uh, uh, faculty member in the School of Design at NC State. Uh, and on um, October the 8th, 1966, uh, Carter Stadium opened. It was state of the art. It looked like an erector set, as you can see in the picture. Um, and um, it was out in the middle of nowhere. Now, these days we don't consider it in the middle of nowhere, but it was built in a research fishing pond uh, that they molded and crafted a stadium. And then they put, brought in these uh, big pre-stressed um, supports that you see on the picture on the right-hand side and uh, built, the, um, built the stadium like an erector set. That's the way it was designed to, build, to, to be put together by Charles Kahn. And it's something that served NC State in great capacity uh, over the years. The difficult thing was that to get it done, uh, NC State had to do some really odd uh, financing. And uh, the um, athletic director at the time decided that uh, all money that was generated by NC State athletics, every penny, had to go to um, relieve the debt on Carter Finley Stadium. So Every penny that was made from 1966 through the end of the um, um, the mortgage on Carter Finley Stadium had to be spent on the football stadium. Um, amazingly, while that debt was supposed to be carried on for 50 years, it was paid off in only 12 um, because of the way, because of the success of other programs in the 1970s, particularly football, winning ACC championships under Lou Holtz, particularly basketball, winning a national championship, baseball, winning ACC championships. It was the golden era of uh, NC State athletics. Uh, Earl Edwards is the person who should be most credited for getting that done and getting Carter Finley Stadium built. It was Carter Stadium when it was first built, it became Carter Finley Stadium when that mortgage was paid off in 1979. Um, he should be credited with getting it built. Uh, Athletics Director Willis Casey should be credited for squeezing every penny out of the program to get that uh, debt paid off so that other programs could benefit from the success that basketball had during the 70s and that football had um, in, the, uh, in the 70s. Now, the the reason for much of that success in the 70s is from uh, a guy who truly was a musician, a magician, uh, and his name was Lou Holtz. Uh, he was about a 135-pound guy who had never played football before in his whole life, uh, but he learned the game, and he learned to coach the game. He learned to motivate his players. Um, Lou is still one of the most dynamic speakers ever. He's called the magician because he used to do these magic tricks. He learned uh, he learned the tricks from a, a magician in uh, Cary, uh, who taught him how to do these things, and it kept Lou from being nervous and talking. Kept his hands engaged. It's something he really uh, enjoyed. If you see the picture uh, on the left, that is uh, Lou Holtz congratulating uh, West Virginia's head coach after the 1975 Peach Bowl. That head coach is named Bobby Bowden, and. Uh, he uh, and Lou faced each other in the last games that uh, Bowden coached at uh, West Virginia in the last game that uh, Lou Holtz coached at NC State in 1975. Mm -hmm. uh, the next era of NC State football was uh, both uh, celebrated and tragic. Um, when uh, Bo Ryan came in to um, take over as head coach from Lou Holtz, um, he led NC State to its most recent ACC championship. Uh, in 1979, uh, I, I, I did skip over uh, one of the most important points of uh, the Earl Edwards 
uh, era, and that is the fact that uh, during his time uh, in the late 1960, he uh, broke the uh, color barrier of, AC, of, of NC State football, first by uh, recruiting a walk-on, uh, Marcus Martin, uh, then by bringing in Clyde Chesney, who was at NC State on a forestry scholarship, and then bringing in NC State's first uh, scholarship uh, African-American players from uh, Enlow High School, uh, Charlie Young and uh, Willie Burden. Willie Burden became uh, ACC Player of the Year in 1971. Uh, was a great uh, a scholar and football player. He became he earned his doctorate and um, was uh, athletics director both down, or, or at North Carolina A and T and was a professor of sports um, sports psychology at uh, Georgia Southern uh, University. Uh, so that made a huge change uh, in the history of uh, ACC. Um, football in uh, ACC, NC State football. Excuse me while I catch up with my, uh, my thoughts here. <laughs> and um, after uh, part of Lou Holtz's success came from uh, twins that he recruited from up in Ohio, Dave and, Dave and Don Bucky, uh, who before they ever played a college game uh, were on the cover of Sports Illustrated, the only NC State um, players featured on the cover of Sports Illustrated. That's because they were in the wave of uh, uh, first freshmen who were able to play college football. Um, and they had great stellar careers. NC State has produced some great quarterbacks. And uh, Dave Bucky is right up there with all of the ones who have had success in the NFL over the last few years. He was a little small to play in the NFL, but he ran uh, Lou Holtz's option uh, and twin veer offenses like nobody ever has. And oftentimes he threw his longest passes to his twin brother, Don, who was a first team All-American. Um, in the aftermath of the Buckies, uh, right when uh, Lou Holtz left to go to the uh, New York Jets, um, came uh, perhaps still the greatest running back in the history of the ACC, Ted Brown. Um, that next photo is maybe my favorite NC State football photo of all time. And that's Ted Brown running for a touchdown against North Carolina and the North Carolina defender coming to a skid stop on his face guard, just trying to catch up with Ted, which he had no, no chance of doing. Um, the, um, the next few years of NC State football were not very good. Uh, Bo Ryan left to take a job at um, LSU, he never got to coach a game there because he was tragically killed in a uh, plane crash going on a recruiting, his first recruiting trip for LSU right after he uh, um, left NC State. He was, he was flying on a short trip, his plane depressurized. He flew right over Raleigh with the uh, pilot of the plane and they crashed into the Atlantic Ocean uh, just east of here. Um, so, over the next few years, when Tom Reed came in to uh, Monty Kiffin first, then Tom Reed came in to uh, replace them, uh, there was not a whole lot of success until um, NC State hired a guy who had beaten the football team for three years. His name was Dick Sheridan. He came from Furman University. And um, he came in and built a program that was as good as any, any, that, any era that's ever been at NC State. He went to the bowl games every year. He came in his first year after three consecutive three and eight seasons under Tom Reed, went to the Peach Bowl his first season, had the ACC um, Offensive Player of the Year and quarterback Eric Kramer, um, and just did a, a, a great job of building a program with players that few other teams wanted um, undersized often, but just players that fit into his system. He was very much a coach who believed in um, recruiting the players he thought would be successful here. And uh, he did a really good job of that. And he recruited um, guys like um, Eric Kramer and uh, Shane Montgomery and Terry Harvey, uh, players who had success here. And they had success because of the system that he ran. When Dick Sheridan left in 1992 because of health problems, he handed the reins over to uh, his um, 
one of his assistant coaches, Michael Kane, who came in and, and was at the forefront of the um, biggest win in NC State football history. And that was in 1998 against Florida State when a guy named uh, Torrey Holt, All-American wide receiver, was the, um, was the key player in leading NC State to an upset win over Florida State when they were ranked number two in the country. Um, in 1999, uh, let's advance forward a little, uh, a little more on the, the um, there's Tori. This is uh, one of um, my favorite pictures because this is uh, on one of the touchdowns that beat Florida State in that game in 1998. Sorry, I'm <clears throat> trying to catch up with my, uh, my thoughts here. But uh, in the aftermath of um, Mike O'Kane, NC State decided to do two big things, change coaches, uh, and they turned to um, a very familiar face to NC State fans, um, a former player, former assistant coach um, named Chuck Amato, who um, came in and changed a lot of perceptions and a lot of attitudes towards NC State, but he also got something big, and that's almost $140 million of investments from um, fans like many of you who are on this uh, program right now um, to, to build a new press box, uh, fill in the entire stadium uh, around the north end zone, um, to do many of the things that make the game day experience what we enjoy so much today at Carter Finley Stadium. It's it's bigger, it's expanded, there are suites. Uh, the game day experience that people enjoy tonight uh, in the season opener is vastly different than all those folks in the white shirts and ties that you saw at Riddick Stadium um, so many years ago. It is a happening it is a place and that really came into being during the uh, uh chuck amato years and carter finley stadium is a great place to tailgate it's a great place for people to gather um and after all of that there are many players who came in like mario williams in this picture right here who was the first overall pick in the nfl draft um but what chuck amato also did was start bringing in players from florida he brought in a, a, a quarterback, his first recruit, whose name was Philip Rivers, set every passing record the ACC has ever had, still owns many of them. Um, it just changed uh, what the perception of NC State football was. In the aftermath, uh, Tom O'Brien came and uh, recruited and uh, had uh, a quarterback named Russell Wilson, who uh, led you know, who, who was a complete surprise and came in and uh, led NC State back to bowl games. Uh, and then after Tom O'Brien, uh, Dave Doran came in. He starts his ninth season as NC State's head coach uh, tonight. Um, but he has been uh, an integral part of that development that has gone on a slow rise through the years. And um, he has produced, just like um, Lou Holtz and um, um, Dick Sheridan and uh, Chuck Amato did. He's re recruited and developed NFL quarterbacks. And right now, NC State is known as quarterback U because, uh, as the next shot slide shows, we have guys who have gone from here to um, the NFL. And right here are all the, all the players from NC State who have moved on from here and became quarterbacks in the NFL. from. Uh, Colin McDonough, who many of you have never heard of, I'm sure, but played here in the late 1930s, transferred to Dayton, and then became the um, quarterback of the uh, Chicago Bears, um, to Roman Gabriel, and Eric Kramer, and Philip Rivers, and Russell Wilson, and Mike Lennon, Jacoby Brissett, Ryan Finley. All these guys have gone on from here, and NC State, you know, gotten tremendous benefit uh, from its NFL coverage because every Sunday when a game is on, they will talk about all of the, re, uh, all of the NC State quarterbacks who uh, have come from here. Now, it's going to be a little weird not seeing Phillip Rivers out there playing, as he did for 16 years with the uh, San Diego Chargers and one year with the uh, Indianapolis Colts. But um, 
NC State still got Russell Wilson, Glennon, Brissett, and Finley, who are currently in the NFL. Um, sort of hur hurried through the last few decades, but uh, I wanted to make sure we put the proper emphasis on um, the um, the early years. Two two couple a couple of things I would say about um, football at NC State, besides being a gathering place, it is a place that um, through its um, you know support staff through its, um, the marching band, through the spirit teams, all the things, it's not just um, the players who make those events special. Um, it is an opportunity for um, men and women to come and enjoy NC State. It become, it's a place where the whole community gathers and people come from far and wide to come to games at NC State. Um, and I will say, being at Carter Finley Stadium, following some of the players, getting to know some of the players like Corey and Philip and Russell um, through the years has been uh, a huge part of uh, me being able to tell some of these stories and me being interested in going and finding out more about some of the uh, players that I did not know about. Uh, I'm going to stop talking because I've done it for 40 consecutive minutes and uh, start answering a few questions. Uh, if uh, the moderators will uh, provide those. All right, I'm looking at those now. All right. I'm getting, getting the questions now. All right. So was football the first sport at NCSU to integrate and what about in the conference? NC uh, football was not the uh, first sport at NC State to integrate, but NC State was the first school in the ACC to integrate athletics. That happened in 1957 uh, when two um, of NC State's first African-American undergraduates competed in a track meet. One of those went on to become uh, captain of the tennis team. They, they both competed in a track meet in 1957. Uh, and then one of them, Erwin Holmes, uh, competed for the tennis team for three years, was the first black captain of a varsity team in the South, and was recently honored by NC State by having a uh, building named in his honor. Um, football integrated later than that, almost 12 years later than that. Um, and it was um, right along with all of the other ACC schools in integrating football. Uh, let's see, a very long time ago, so I understand if you don't know, but do you have any comment on the 1896 football season? Bill Beasley and a few historical papers I have found said state banned sports that season, but we have a record win over Guilford that I've never been able to find out much about. Uh, I do know what you're talking about in terms of um, that, uh, that season in 1996, or sorry, 1896. Um, I did not cover the game, but there, there was a ban on um, sports off campus, and there was so much um, protest over that that the ban only lasted about uh, three or four weeks, and they did come back and play a, a game against outside of Pullman, but there were very few, I think there were two games played in that 1896 season, and it did come back. Um, in the next year and has been, uh, except for the time that five games were canceled during the uh, eight, 1918 pandemic, NC State has played uh, without interruption ever since. Uh, what made Ted Brown so good? Ted Brown was undersized. He wasn't recruited by any other school, um, but he was powerful. He had huge, huge legs that uh, could both explode with speed and um, with power as well. Um, he just, he had a great offensive line in front of him, the mm -hmm. twin veer system and option system that NC State ran at the time was great for running backs. He was in the right place at the right time in that regard, but he took advantage of that by um, uh, just being an explosive runner um, he once ran 99 yards for a touchdown against Syracuse. Um, and nobody has ever been quite like him in 
ACC football because he held his and he's held that record for so long. He was the ACC's all-time leading record uh, rusher, a record that was broken last year by uh, Clemson's Travis at the end, except for the fact that Ted Brown's rushing yardage in bowl games during his career was not counted in his career totals. So he actually still has more rushing yards if you include his regular season games and his postseason games than any other running back in ACC history. And I don't have an answer on uh, where Ryan Finley is right now. I did see also that he was cut by the Bengals. Um, also, on the note of marching band, can you talk about any of their history? The marching band has been a, a huge part of uh, NC State football uh, going well back into the 19 teens. Uh, NC State had a concert band. They would pull the Red Coat Marching Band out of that concert band. Uh, it was always a, a big part of it. They would always have huge um, um, halftime shows that entertained the crowds at Riddick Stadium and at Carter Stadium and at Carter Finley Stadium. I know uh, in the 70s, or I believe it was in the 1980s, it became known as the Power Sound of the South. It's a large group mm -hmm. of uh, you know, for, for a school that doesn't have a music, a music department, it has a music department, does not have a major, uh, has always cobbled together a great band um, that um, while it's never been on the field to call or affect the outcome of a game like some other schools, has always been a huge part of uh, the uh, support system that NC State football has had. Uh, did Daryl Dess and Alec, Alex Webster, who were NFL stars, earn All-American honors? They were not All-American honors um, at that time um, because NC State was on a very small scale to the rest of college football at the time. Maryland and Clemson were the big names in this region uh, to the very beginning of the ACC era. Um, but... Um, Alec Webster did uh, lead the Southern Conference in scoring as a um, uh, as a junior and made All Southern, but uh, he did not make and neither did he did not make any All American teams. Neither did Daryl Des um, at the time. Oh, let's see. You mentioned the Bucky Twins, who were great yes. athletes. But can you provide any commentary on which of the many Wolfpack Twins over the years were the greatest story to cover? Well, I will confess that I do not have in front of me a list of all of the twins uh, of, uh, that have played at NC State in football. Um, I can tell you, however, that Dave and Don Bucky uh, contributed as much as any two players, any two brothers who have ever played at NC State. They're both great um, supporters of the program now. Uh, Don flies up from Florida for all the home games. Dave's still in the area. Um, I might have that backwards, uh, but that wouldn't be the first time the two of those have been confused. Uh, but they are both great supporters. They are underrated players from the 70s and uh, two guys that I really have a lot of respect for. Uh, what is your prediction for this season? <laughs> History has taught me, and you know, I'm a student of history and a writer of history, and history has taught me to never make predictions because I'm always wrong. I think Dave Doran has a great and uh, talented squad. I think they have every opportunity to be successful. I'll be eager to see how things go tonight to see what happens, but uh, I know better than to make predictions. Um, we have a follow-up question about the Bucky Twins. Um, so how about just brothers? I remember the pair from South Carolina that played in the mid nineties. I believe you're talking about the Redmond brothers who uh, came and uh, were offensive linemen uh, under uh, in, in the uh, Michael Kane era. And uh, the greatest thing about the Redmond brothers were they the best quotes that you could ever have if you're a newspaper reporter and looking for somebody to comment on an upcoming game or what happened in, in a previous game. They were both great contributors to uh, the program. All right. Um, so do you have, uh, in covering NC State football, do you have a favorite moment? A little bit prejudice on my part, but there will never be a moment 
that I've ever seen that can compare to what happened in, on November 1st, 1986 at Carter Finley Stadium. NC State was playing South Carolina, just like uh, happened in uh, 1957. There was a penalty at the end of the game. Time had expired. South Carolina thought they had won. They were celebrating. They were taunting uh, the quarterback, Eric Kramer, from across the line. And they jumped across the line as time expired, and a penalty was called on South Carolina. And it gave NC State one more play. Now, they called timeout. They went over the sidelines. Dick Sheridan was the head coach at the time, and he called up. He literally drew a play in the dirt on the sidelines of Carter Finley Stadium. He sent everybody down the field. And he sent this really fast track guy, whose name is Danny Peebles. He actually still works with the track team on occasion at NC State. Fastest guy I ever saw on the football field. And he told Danny to run down the field and Derek was, or, uh, Eric Kramer was going to find him and throw him the ball. They threw it up in the ends or on the sideline. They went in. They ran the play. Um, you can see uh, on some very um, grainy footage that um, – when Eric Kramer throws the ball up, um, every receiver and defender on the field goes up to try to knock it down. It gets through all of their hands. It lands right in Danny Peebles' hands for a touchdown, and NC State won that game that, um, in an incredible fashion at the end of a season where they had all of these comeback wins. It was very much like the 1983 National Championship in basketball, all these uh, unbelievable wins, and that was the most unbelievable of all, except for the fact that on the play, uh, when Eric Kramer threw the ball, he was hit by a South Carolina defender. He was injured on the play, and he was unable to play the next week at Virginia, and that cost NC State and Dick Sheridan a chance to win the ACC championship, something that hasn't been done even still since 1979 when um, NC State last won an ACC title. That will always be my favorite moment. I was a student at NC State at the time. I was writing about uh, the game uh, from the press box up in Carter Finley Stadium. Um, and then just to see what Danny Peebles, who uh, had a chance to play, had a chance to qualify for the 1988 Olympics, but instead decided to come back to NC State to play football so that he had the possibility of playing in the NFL, which he did do. Um, all the circumstances of that um, make that my favorite moment of covering NC State football. Now, I was at the game in 98 when they beat Florida State. I was at the game in 2001 when uh, NC State beat Florida State in Tallahassee. But um, even those games, incredible upsets, won't com ever really compare to um, that game in 1996 for me. Wow, that sounds like an amazing experience. Um, what's next for the athletic facilities? I know Doak Field is due, but anything big, big planned for next year in football? That I cannot answer. That's a question that uh, would best be uh, posed to um, someone in the athletics department. I did work in athletics for about uh, nine years, but I'm no longer there. And certainly I, am, I can't speak for what their plans are. Uh, let's see. Um, so I think uh, I think you skipped over the picture of Cower and Richer, both great players at NCS, the former who became a legendary coach in the NFL and the latter an Outland Trophy winner, also a great NFL career. And absolutely. The one, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, you go. Um, no, I included that uh, those two pictures of uh, Coach Cower and uh, um Jim Richard, just because of those two things. They were the, um, Richard was the first to win a major award, the Outland Trophy uh, at NC State, uh, had an unbelievable uh, career in the NFL, was one of the big reasons why Ted Brown was so good, because he was on the offensive line that blocked for Ted Brown. Um, had an incredible career, is now an American Airlines pilot, uh, still does a daily flight uh, from here He's based here in Raleigh. Um, and uh, Coach Cower, I just wrote extensively about because he became the first NC State um, former player to be inducted into the 
in a, or the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. We had a great celebration up there for, uh, for that a couple of weekends ago and um, has always represented um, NC State in, in a class manner uh, as an analyst on NFL. My favorite thing about Bill Cower that he did, he married one, uh, one of the two twins on KGL's basketball team that he met while he was a student here. And in 1996, when the Pittsburgh, when he took the Pittsburgh Steelers to the uh, Super Bowl uh, the, for the first time uh, with him as head coach, he sent a ticket to that game in Arizona to Kay Yow to thank her for all that she had done for his wife, Kay. Uh, and Kay Yow flew out to Arizona to watch the Super Bowl where uh, Bill Cower was coaching the uh, Steelers. They did not win it that year, but 10 years later, um, they did win the Super Bowl. Kay Yow couldn't go because she had a game that day or she would have gone then too. Uh, so 20,000 fans at Riddick Stadium seems like a lot back then. Why was the program still losing money? Um, because there, there, there weren't many um, sports at the time. Um, in fact, in the 1940s, NC State had part-time coaches. The uh, basketball coach Leroy J um, was the um, was a, um, a an administrator in the highway department, and he would come and coach basketball on the side. Um, there's just not a lot of revenue coming in. Um, it took money to buy uh, various things. Uh, NC State once lost a uh, athletics director who uh, had to go in front of the state legislature to this, to tell them why he spent. $8, I believe it was, for baseballs, for NC State's baseball team to uh, play an exhibition game against the Boston Braves and Babe Ruth down in Fayetteville. Money was very tight, uh, and even $8 could change the nature of the uh, department's budget. And to be as far in debt as they were during that time um, took a Herculean effort to, uh, to pay that debt off. And... Um, there's no wonder that uh, football was on the chopping block because of it. Uh, let's see. And I think this will be the last question. Um, can you confirm that NCSU integrated the ACC? And this is definitely something that should be publicized more. I can 100% confirm it by every, um, every written newspaper account of that. Um, I, I have written extensively about um, Erwin Holmes and the other three African Americans who uh, who came in as students in uh, 1956, the first time that um, the state legislature allowed uh, system schools to uh, accept underclassmen um, African American and Black uh, students, they immediately started um, participating in athletics. Uh, Walter Holmes, who is not related to Erwin Holmes, played soccer and was a member of the marching band at the time. NC State, um, in fact, uh, tried to take its marching band to Clemson uh, for a game in 1958, and Clemson would not let the band come because it had a member um, that was African-American. Um, I agree completely that it is something that NC State should celebrate as much as possible. I commend uh, Chancellor Woodson because he was the driving force in renaming a building on campus in Erwin Holmes' name. Erwin Holmes became NC State's first African-American graduate. He got a degree in electrical engineering. He uh, walked across the stage at Reynolds Coliseum. Um, I've spent time with him um, and his family at his home uh, and here on campus. And nobody has been more proud of holding that place and more proud of the degree that he got at NC State because of the opportunities he got than Erwin Holmes has. He integrated uh, track and tennis and the ACC owes him a huge debt for all that he endured and all that he did through his athletic and through his professional career. Great, well, thank you so much, Tim. Um, that I, I learned a lot about NC State football, and we really appreciate you sharing your, your knowledge and enthusiasm with, with us. Um, and we can't, we can't wait to cheer the pack on tonight against the South, South Florida Bulls. Um, and our next campus history program, our, our next campus history program is gonna be NC State 
campus architecture on October 6th. 6th. Um, we hope to see everyone there. And we'll also, we're going to be dropping a survey in the chat and participants will be able to um, enter into a raffle to win Tim Peeler's books and also some NC State memorabilia. Um, and if you have any, any questions about what was discussed, to, discussed today, feel free to email the Friends of the Library office and we'll be sure to connect you with Tim to get those questions answered. I wanna thank you all for joining us today and um, go pack. Bye everyone.